Hi, if you're just finding this channel, I'm Dylan Shab, and I've been pretty much obsessed with the coming metaverse for the last decade. Today, I am joined by Anthony Berto Bertonson. Um, I am guessing your Italian origin and was probably something like Bertocini or something. How are you doing, it man? It was. It was. I'm doing amazing, man. And you actually got it spot on. It was Bertoncini. And then when my ancestors moved to America, they wanted to blend in a little more. So they got rid of the I at the end and just went by Bertonson. But I'm doing great today, man. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, I've got... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ethnically Jewish, and uh, so we have a lot of those kinds of American and South African last name stories. Uh, yes. We were actually uh, from Lithuania, so we were Feitelson, okay. but um, that was really too difficult for the customs control. So they said, yeah. you know, Shab, which is actually Shochet Ubodek, which means slaughterer and checker. So he basically Dang. gave his job profession instead of his last name, and here we are. That sounds, the, the, the second one sounds way cooler though. Exactly, exactly. Um, cool, so tell me a little bit about yourself because I think you're, you know, I consider you, I've met you in uh, MTG, which was an NFT project. I mean, it's still a big mm -hmm. uh, NFT project. Uh, and I just felt like, wow, this is a guy with many hats. So I want to get him on my podcast. Tell me, yeah. tell me, tell me about the things you're doing, man. Gosh, dude, where do we begin? So, I mean, long story short, I guess it's not going to be short. It's going to take a few minutes. But uh, when I was 19 years old, um, kind of was in college and started my little entrepreneurial journey. Um, I got into videography and photography right away just because that was a passion of mine. I loved doing it. It was a hobby. Uh, and within six months, I managed to turn it into an actual career. I got an opportunity to move down to Scottsdale, Arizona in the United States and start co-hosting um, some entrepreneur incubators and like networking events. I was doing the content creation for all the events, but we were having a ton of huge speakers come down there um, and had 300 to 500 people come to our house during these events. It was awesome. And just during that time period, I expanded my network a ton when I was 19. And long story short, that kind of ended up failing after about eight months. I moved back to Kansas City, Missouri, which is where I'm from. Um, still kept up with the content creation. And around that same time, I saw Gary V talking about uh, TikTok a ton, um, which is when I began my start on TikTok. And within six months, I just, you know, I didn't, I've been doing personal branding for like two years prior and then all the entrepreneur events. So I kind of had it down. So when I finally went to start growing my own personal brand, uh, I think we went zero to a million in like six months time. So Absolutely crazy. From then on, um, I've been self-employed since I was 19. I started an agency as well you, when I got you little. Saying you, <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm thinking who my viewership is, and you keep saying 19. Um, how yeah. old are you now, Anthony? 22. 22. Okay. So, you know, it's 22. I mean, three years is a long time in the space, I know. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, you know. <laughs> it's like I've shoved a lot. I've shoved. Ago. I, I do. I've just done a lot in the last few years. And then as you can kind of see here, for doing some recording, I have 19 tatted on my wrist too, just because it was a substantial year for me. Right. Um, but to quickly finish that story, when I got back here, started making content on TikTok. Um, on top of that, I have always been passionate about e-commerce and doing media buying. So I started a little digital marketing agency and then got a little burnt out from content creation. I still do it a lot, obviously, but, uh, I came across NFTs also because of Gary Vee, coincidentally. I mean, it's changed my life like two or three times now. And uh, about three or four months ago, I started doing my research, did about a month or two months of research, managed to have some friends that launched projects in the space, uh, Magic Mushroom Clubhouse, Brett, and then uh, Astro Heads, and managed to get a hold of a couple of those without putting any of my own money in. So, you know, I got to tangle around with OpenSea, see how the buying and selling process worked before investing any of my own money. And then as of literally like January 1st, I started trading with my own money. Um, and it's going pretty well so far. Cool. So let's, let's before we go into NFTs, you know, I've got the privilege of having a long form podcast so I can yeah. kind of delve into a few topics. Let's break that down a bit. So after, after you had been doing your incubators, you mm -hmm. went, as you said, into digital marketing, uh, content creation. And um, I think, I, I'm, if I'm not wrong, you have a, a lifestyle blog um, yes. or newsletter. Yes, also... Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so that's honestly probably my main focus right now. I completely forgot to mention it when I explain that story just because there's so many different things I try to do. But um, no, it's good. Yeah, no, it's good. So during that time period when I got on TikTok, like I mentioned, started gaining a following, I wanted to 
you know, take my audience off platform and kind of build a community just because I know that on social media, it's kind of, you know, trends come and go, your audience, the engagement's super high sometimes, and a year later, you might not be as popular. So I wanted to get them off platform. So I, you know, started a Discord server and then also started collecting emails for a newsletter. Um, and for about a year and a half, I was doing it for free. I was writing these sick ass, uh, you know, motivation and self-development newsletters. And then not until... November that I actually monetize it and turn it more into a subscription thing. So I launched the VIP version of my newsletter, which pretty much teaches people, you know, all the things they don't learn in school, you know, credit, how to, you know, set up a business and LLC in the United States, um, how to travel hack, how to optimize their fitness and health, you know, that type of lifestyle. And then we also go over personal branding, content creation, investing, NFTs, all that stuff. Uh, very cool. And um, I, it, from our conversations, I believe uh, wellness and health is something you take pretty seriously, right? Um, yes, 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 yes. Indeed. I mean, so, Tom, me, I think you're in the middle of a 70 day uh, uh, challenge. Yeah. No, I'm doing 75 hard right now. So if anybody listening or you are familiar with Andy Frisella has one of like the biggest business podcasts on iTunes you know, all those platforms. Sure. And I think in 2019 is when he started this challenge, but it's called 75 hard. Long story short, uh, every single day you have to do a number of challenges, which entail like working out twice a day for at least 45 minutes. One of those two workouts has to be outside, no matter what the weather is, it could be snowing, a tornado, hurricane, you know, whatever's going on outside, you got to get it done that day. Uh, you got to read 10 pages of a self-development book. You have to diet, go on, uh, no cheat meals, no alcohol, drink a gallon of water, which I actually have sitting right here next to me and uh, take a progress picture. So I think in, there's all, in all like seven or eight different things. I'm on day 60 right now. So I got about two weeks left, but Amazing. it's been life changing. It's been awesome. Amazing. Cool. So now that you've kind of got your feet wet in all of these different areas, um, again, before we get to NFTs and cryptos. So what is your main focus now? Is the newsletter and the marketing agency your, your core focus right now? Yeah, so it's a it's mainly two things. Um, NFTs crypto is going to be one of them. And then that newsletter is going to be the second. And content creation is starting to become the third again, just because I realized how um, valuable it is to be making active content on TikTok and uh, YouTube to promote that newsletter. Like they've been my two biggest uh, traffic drivers since I started it by far. So I have an educational TikTok where I cover pretty much all those topics I listed earlier. Um, and I'm launching a YouTube channel actually this week, tomorrow, hopefully the video is going to go live, but, uh, those are my two focuses. The agency thing. I just, I got good at media buying. I don't actively look for clients, but just since I've expanded my network so much in the last two or three years, I kind of just get referred to people every so often. So right now I'm only currently working with, I think three clients for marketing. Um, but like I said, those are my focuses are a little elsewhere. Super. Great. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've been really impressed um, by your generation in general. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have a bit of a funny history when it comes to collectibles. I, I've always been a bit of a geek. Um, I was playing Magic the Gathering when I was like, 10, yeah. and then I was like an, a judge and everything else. And I remember clearly when Pokemon came out, you know, <laughs> and, and oh, yeah. I, I remember this, you know, recently because, you know, Logan, Logan was talking, you know, like how, you know, how, his whole squad have become major Pokemon collectors and they're buying this stuff for insane prices. And I remember that coming out. And I remember sitting with like my core Magic the Gathering friends because we yeah. were like this, this shopping mall and they would have a Sunday tournament. And then there was this new squad of kids who were coming with their Pokemon cards. And we just laughed and we laughed and we laughed. And yeah. five years later, we weren't laughing anymore because Pokemon had like utterly dwarfed the Magic the Gathering franchise. Yeah. And then I remember sitting in, in Second Life in 2011 when Minecraft came out. And again, oh, yeah. you know, we sat there like snobby vampires, laughing uh -huh. and laughing and laughing. And two years later, when it clocked past a million active users, we weren't laughing anymore. That's and um, so when, when I heard about like Beeple NFT selling uh, yeah. for 60 million, I was like, holy shit, I'm not <laughs> doing this again. Where yeah. are, where, where is the next generation? You know, I was watching quite a few of those influencers at the time. I love podcasts and uh, mm -hmm. quite a few of them have started making fantastic material. And yeah. uh, I just dived into NFTs, even though it really was much more undeveloped, right? In other words, you know, if you're looking for fantastic graphics, right? What we yeah. would call high fidelity in the industry. So you're going to look for a game like Fortnite. And mm -hmm. yet I think... 
anyone who's been in the NFT space for a while or crypto for a while knows that there's something really exciting happening over here. It's almost like we're starting, you know, back back with pixels and like really easy yeah, stuff. Yeah. But the speed at which uh, we're catching up is insane. It's developing extremely fast. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So then, so you said you you bumped into some Gary V content uh, mm -hmm. and and had a couple of friends join the space. Uh, so yeah. how long have you been, would you say, investing in NFTs? Uh, actively, I've only been trading for about a month now. Um, I've been in the space, though, for, I'd say, three months. But, you know, Gary, like I said a little bit earlier, has completely changed my life like two or three times. It started with, uh, he's the whole reason I went down to Arizona and started that stuff in the first place, because I was providing free value through Instagram DMs, uh, which he talks a lot in his, about his book, uh, Crushing It. And then when he started talking about NFTs and stuff on his podcast and on YouTube, I immediately hopped on it, did my like two months of research. I think he only recommends like two weeks, but you know, I like to very, I, I like to analyze and understand everything before really getting into it. Um, so I did that for about two months. And like I said, only been trading for about a month now, but it's going extremely well. Fantastic. And then you mentioned a couple of your friends have also been in the space. Do you, you know Brett and a few others personally, or you met them online or what? Yes, yeah, so I met Brett and then Brandon Priest and a few other guys in Vegas, actually, in November. We have a lot of mutual friends. Um, another YouTuber named Sebastian Giorgio has been a buddy of mine since those Arizona days in 2019. And now since Brett and Brandon are all living down in Arizona, they just all somehow met. And then in November, we all had a little meetup in Vegas. And that's where I kind of met Brett and Brandon for the first time. They're actually from my hometown, coincidentally, too. So we have a lot of mutual friends. So kind of hit it off right away. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I consider all of those names you just mentioned to be the new guard. Uh, and mm -hmm. they, uh, they're doing a fantastic job because they've all arrived, really, since NFTs exploded in regular drops, right? I, you know, yep. the original kind of the old guard arrived, you know, when, when Bored Apes was happening. The, there, was, there were not many drops happening at a single time. And yeah. now, you know, there are so many drops happening every week uh, that that these guys have basically helped education become part of the meta, right? Seb is doing these great videos as well. Brett and uh, Kosher Plug and these guys are creating alpha groups to help to help make smarter investors or just yeah. kind of sift through the content overload. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm you know I've gained a lot from them as well. Um, yeah. and, you know they've all done a couple of recent drops and I you know. I, I hope we see more of that. Um, so, so. Cool. And uh, did you have any involvement in crypto before NFTs or was it literally you jumped in straight into NFTs? Um, I was a dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin for the last like year and a half. Um, but other than that, no, it wasn't really. Occasionally traded some altcoins and stuff like that. But apart from Bitcoin being my main investment, no, nothing, nothing else. Cool. Okay, something I want to ask you about is, you know, mass adoption is a major question right now, right? At some, mm -hmm. I, I, I believe, and again, I don't even know where this figure is from, but something like 5% of the world know about NFTs and a much smaller yeah. number actually have bought one, right? Yep. And, um, you know, one of the things you see so often with NFT drops recently is like people like, oh, wow, you know, Justin Bieber bought in or, you know, some sports person bought in. Wow, this is going to moon. Right. And then it doesn't yeah. people like cry and what's going on. And yeah. um, and, you know, I, I was listening into an AMA was one of the founders of Creeps. And he's mm -hmm. like, look, guys, of course, we want to do serious marketing. But, you know, just throwing NFTs at celebrities because they send us DMs all the time. Give us a a a. a NFT and we'll give you a shout out doesn't yeah. necessarily help because although they have a hundred thousand viewers, how many of those people are actually then buying into NFTs, right? The, the conversion yep. rate, if we were to use marketing lingo. Um, mm -hmm. So now that you're making content again on TikTok, um, what has been the response? Like, has it been a positive response of people asking quality questions? Do you see some of your viewers are actually joining the space? Um, so what, what I kind of want to touch on, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of want to touch on two points. I want to touch on the whole celebrity thing because I actually had a big learning lesson in the space this past month in regards to that. Um, but to touch on, you know, the second part of your question first, uh, like I said, I started making the crypto and kind of educational content on TikTok first. I know YouTube is probably a lot better of a platform for that, but I, you know, I'm familiar with TikTok. I've grown an audience there already. I know how the algorithm and content creation works on the platform. So I started literally a month ago, have already hit about 35,000 followers on that account since then. But the response has been extremely positive. Somehow I've managed to um, 
you know, target that specific niche that is kind of already familiar with NFTs. I actually haven't been getting a whole lot of questions in regards to like, what is an NFT in the first place? You know, stuff like that. Unless the video goes super viral and then, you know, you start targeting a bunch of people. But right now I'm averaging anywhere from probably, I'd say 10 to 50,000 views per video. Um, and a majority of those people actually are already pretty familiar with the space. They know how whitelisting works. They know, you know, how to go mint a project on Etherscan. Uh, so it was actually quite surprising, contradictory to what you would expect. Oh, cool. No, no, that's, that's, that's very positive. And then you wanted to touch on celebrities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So going off what you just said in regards to, you know, having celebrities promote projects and celebrities launching projects. This past month, I had an experience with Lana Rhodes's project, CryptoSys. Yeah, I got whitelisted for that on just a random Twitter thing. I was like, okay, I've won the whitelist spot. I might as well kind of follow along with the project, see what happens with it. And going into it, I already was very um, nervous uh, going and minting the project because I noticed right away, like everybody, if you've been in the NFT space, it's already kind of, um, you know, a little hesitant on Instagram projects. But the main traffic driver that she, you know, was utilizing was her following on Instagram. And she has like, you know, 3 million plus followers, I think, on Instagram. And like you said, a very small percentage of those people actually know what NFTs are. They know how to go to Coinbase, buy Ethereum, transfer it, make a MetaMask wallet, and actually go buy, you know, a project on, on Mint. Um, so, you know, after launch, immediately the price just started tanking. Like, I think you could mint for 0 0.08 Ethereum. Um, I did the max of three and within like 30 minutes, the price was pretty much at the exact same price. Uh, you minted four and they didn't even sell out the mint yet. Like it just tanked. And the main conclusion I could come to from that is that all of these people that came from her Instagram that, you know, did barely any research on how to actually invest into a good NFT project started, you know, fudding out of the project when it wasn't making them, you know, four or five X right away. And a lot of people were selling for losses because all these people that are first time buyers on OpenSea, they got to pay that, you know, first time seller's fee. They have to deal with royalties, um, you know, with the project, the OpenSea fee, all this stuff. So people were losing tons of money. And when the public sale came around, nobody wanted to buy the public sale because you could go buy it on OpenSea for cheaper than what the public sale mint price was. So it was an absolute train wreck. Um, she probably... It, that and there's like the whole aspect of her not being too active in the community every once in a while she you know go say hi but it seemed just from my perspective like it was kind of a cash grab and she had a whole other team kind of handling it, it wasn't very hands-on um so that whole project was just a learning lesson to me and you know to do extra betting and stuff before investing in any sort of celebrity project yeah i you know i i think this is is, is a learning spring for all of us i mean you know it's uh, we don't even have the vocabulary for it yet, right? Like I consider yeah. Gary V to be probably the most important bridge between both worlds. And then, you know, and so now I start to look for guys who are important influencers who are also looking, if they launch a project, how much are they onboarding, right? For example, when Shaquille O'Neal dropped Shaq Gives Back, uh, yeah. I fatted it heavily. I was, I was just very upset about it. I, I thought, yeah. uh, you know, I thought Shaq's intentions were probably good, but mm -hmm. this is just going to drain. Basically, this is a forced donation from the crypto whales, right? Yeah. Um, and when I saw Colin Teeley, uh, Castle Kids, I thought his intention was really good, but he just hadn't understood um, how the space works, right? How, what are yeah. profile picks? What, what are they supposed to be doing? Where I got really excited on the flip side was uh, Ozzy Osbourne entering. Yes. Uh, because I think he... He nailed it on, on understanding like what the space is about, what the culture is about. He did that really funny video with his wife, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> and she even said, you know, NGMI. And they just, it was a real respectful way uh, for them to enter the space. And the community loved it. And, you know, they, yeah. they even added a push point where, you know, the next drop is a mutation, but you're mutating mm -hmm. your bet with one of the OG sets, right? So yeah, it, it was just really smart how they went about it. Um, and well, uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm being very cautious about those. I don't want to fight them out because I think, of course, we want mainstream adoption. Mm -hmm. We just mustn't kind of lose our heads on, you know, oh, wow, some major sportsman came in. There, therefore, I'm going to, yeah. you know, 4X immediately. I think if any of the celebrities are to continue to do that, they need to, you know, start putting out some sort of educational content in regards to how to go through the whole process of buying their project, the whole meaning behind it, 
the thing with Ozzy Osbourne is, is that it was innovative. It was the first project to, you know, really do that whole where you could, you know, bite one of the OG projects and then make a whole other NFT out of it. So tons of people, you know, that owned Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs or I think Cool Cats or, you know, whatever other projects you could utilize, you know, for that feature, um, were instantly going to go buy it. One, because it's Ozzy Osbourne. It's awesome. He understood the space. He did his research, you know, learned all the lingo and all that stuff, understood the community before launching it. Um, and he, and just had he, a, he himself owns quite a few NFTs. Actually. Exactly. He, he, he is exactly. an avid collector. That's what I'm saying. So I think a lot, a lot of celebrities that are planning on getting into the space need to follow, you know, his roadmap that he kind of laid out with that project. Yeah, yeah. If they, in other words, I think I think it, it becomes a plus if they're bringing in a community as well. Then it's like mm -hmm. a cherry on top, like you know, because because the one thing you can rely on is you know these projects that we're calling a rug, right? That are tanky. Yeah. None of them have had any dangerous elements to them, right? In other words, mm -hmm. one thing celebrities definitely can bring is their integrity, right? And yeah. it's pretty much everyone can be sure that the project they're not just going to run off the, with the money. Rather, the question is, why do we need this, right? Yeah. And, what, and, and again, the same question we're supposed to be asking all projects. What value is their roadmap adding? As long as yeah. those two questions are answered, I think, uh, you know, like, you know, projects like Top Shots have done great, right? I mean, yeah, there is, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the idea of, of bringing collectible kind of memorabilia into NFTs is a brilliant idea. I mean, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to touch on what, what do you think about all of these clothing brands entering the space? Oh gosh. So I, the, the one that stands out to me right away is I think it was goat or StockX, one of those two, which do you remember which one was oh, doing? Clone X. Yeah. The well, not, no, 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 no. Um, uh, the shoe company. Was oh. it goat? I, I don't remember which one it is. It's either goat or StockX. They yeah. pretty much, you know, two companies that resell uh, like high beast shoes, you know, expensive shoes, stuff like that. And the main reason they stood out to me is because I thought the model made extreme sense. So to quickly explain what that looks like is right now you can download like the Go app or StockX app and you can go on, you can buy these shoes, they'll ship up to your house, stuff like that. And a lot of people that are in that space, you know, are more so collectors than they are people that are going to go wear $5,000 pair of shoes around every single day. So what they did was you were able to go purchase an NFT of the shoe and if you did that, you had the option to not have it shipped to your house. You could lock it in, you know, a vault at their, you know, warehouse or wherever it was. And you technically own it, but they're just, you know, holding on to it. So what these people could do then was take that NFT and still resell it the same way they would resell it on eBay um, or Facebook Marketplace or any of those websites. Uh, but the kicker is now that Go and StockX or whichever one was doing it still has access to that shoe. They're kind of gaining... Um, the royalties off those secondary market sales that they weren't getting when, you know, people would go buy their shoes, they'd get it, and then they'd sell it on eBay. You know, eBay, it's a whole other platform. Now, you know, there's no difference from the reseller standpoint. They're still, you know, technically owning the shoe, flipping it for a profit, but that main company is now getting a percentage of those secondary market royalties that they weren't getting in the first place. So I think there is a huge um, opening or opportunity, I think is a better word, for these clothing companies, like I'm excited to see what Nike does. Not that they've worked with uh, with Clonex and uh, you know Takashi Murakami and all that. Um, really, what they have planned, Adidas, you know, kind of got into it a little bit. But I think the best example so far would be those two shoe companies. I think one of them's actually getting sued by Nike because <laughs> because they're like selling the, you know the rights to the shoe. Yeah, you know? yeah, they were using the visual the visual labels, which uh, yeah. which is a violation of trademark. Um, yeah, it's I, a good I idea, think, but they missed two, that. <laughs> I think you actually touched on two good points. I think there is the branding aspect. In other words, you know, Nike knocked it out of the park by buying Clone X. But I think what Adidas got right was Adidas is the first time we really saw using an NFT profile pic as a, as a model, right? Like they mm. stuck their tracksuit on a board ape. And that is yep. an iconic image I think that we're going to have with us for a long time. And yeah. anyone, you know, who's in fashion knows fashion is a flex, right? And so if you've got the entire Twitter we're kind of with these apes wearing your tracksuit, that yeah. is uh, an invaluable amount of, of kind of, you know, branding. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that has a value to these, to these enormous um, conglomerates, uh, Louis yeah. Vuitton and so on. So I think there's that aspect that I'm really excited about is kind of the global brand or the Coca-Cola effect, right? I would call that the Coca-Cola yeah. effect, right? Coca-Cola has, has managed like Madonna to stay in our faces front and center decade after decade and, and yeah. always be the first choice that comes to mind, right? 
Um, and then I think the second point you raised is the idea of what we call the bearer bond, right? The bearer stock. This yeah. NFT entitles the bearer to collect X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, the most famous use case of that is actually gold. Um, yeah. You know, gold was redemption. You know, you could redeem this certificate for a gold bar. And, mm -hmm. and as you said so correctly, the ongoing royalties creates a major incentive for these companies uh, to, to do the maintenance, right? Like I know yeah. that on the Tim Ferriss show, he discussed how wine, boutique wine companies and whiskey companies could m majorly jump in on this, right? Because sometimes yeah. they have like waiting lists for 40 years, right? Uh -huh. Like for your pickup. Yeah. In California, you've got these places. And if someone could constantly sell that on, right? Because they, whatever, they're going to sell it as a profit. And the company itself is getting royalties from their secondary sales, that's an amazing win-win. I agree. Something I've actually thought about recently is when, you know, NFTs start to become more mainstream in, you know, the next three to five years, maybe more. Um, I think eBay and like Facebook Marketplace and all these sort of secondary market reselling websites are going to, you know, go out of business almost. You know, like if yeah. people were able to start, to, these major companies are able to start selling digital ownership to all their products and claim the royalties from secondary market sales on it. I don't see a purpose of ever listing anything on those websites anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, I think, I think the level of disruption that's coming is something that we just can't even wrap our heads around and it, 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 yeah. it, it will probably start, you know, it's starting almost as a whimper and then it's mm -hmm. going to be an, you know, a resounding avalanche at some point. And um, yeah. I'm just so excited to be in the space. We're early. We're extremely We're early. Really early. I mean, what was know, it? This... There was... <laughs> I said there was only what, like a million wallets currently trading NFTs, something around there. It's not much at all. You, you know, I feel no. like a, an old, an old stage sometimes when I talk to some new people, like, cause every one of these big projects, I meet people that they're so excited. This is my first mint and, you know, board apes yeah. eventually comes out and they're like, oh, damn, I missed it. Like it's a million years ago. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you are so early. You don't even last understand year. how early you are. You know? Last year, could have got 20 of those things and turned it into a few million dollars in less mm -hmm. than a year. Well, the journey club did that, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, um, there's there's something you know there's a saying I love luck favors the prepared right mm -hmm. the reality is some of the the major influencers who are doing so well now have been grinding the space for many years right yeah um, you know even Brett did not come yeah. out of nowhere I mean Brett mm -hmm. has been you know poking around in the marketing space and came in and Doge Pound and Pudgy Penguin. And not to mention that most of these guys had a, a couple of bad mints as well and, oh, yeah. and had the balls to stick around. So, you know, it has not been rosy for everyone. There have been some bear markets as well. And uh, yeah, we are just super early. Yeah, I'm so excited for it. I'm so excited. I, I, I want to share an offer from your TikTok, something mm -hmm. I didn't know and I thought it was really cool. Um, yeah. You mentioned that Instagrams, because most of the, the NFT space is on Twitter, uh -huh. a lot of these groups, when they do Instagram whitelist offerings, it's yep. much easier to get on that, that list. Tell me about that. Yeah. So something I realized kind of accidentally, I want to be honest. Um, so since I had that following from TikTok, I managed to accumulate a good size following on Instagram as well. I leveraged all that, got some news publications to get verified. So I'd say my Instagram is pretty established, you know, personal brand wise. So my original idea was like, okay, since the crypto space, all these NFT DGNs are on Twitter and Discord, uh, no one's really touched anything on Instagram. Like I know a lot of these projects are releasing on Instagram. Lately, they've been more quality than they were a month or two ago. Um, up until then, it was kind of just entrepreneurs doing cash grab type projects. It wasn't very good. But I was going to these Twitter accounts, just huge like um, hype bears or let's use imaginary ones, for example, because that's a good one coming out soon. Um, they have almost 200k followers on Twitter, right? And if you go to their Instagram, I think I don't remember recently, but it's like 20 or 30k. Um, when I first got on there, they had less than 10k. So they were still doing these whitelist giveaways on the Instagram, you know, just the same ones they were doing on Twitter, but there was only 10% or less people entering those giveaways versus the ones on Twitter. So I was like, okay, well, you know, logically that makes sense to enter those versus the Twitter ones. <laughs> because my odds of winning any sort of giveaway would be a lot higher. Um, so now anytime I kind of find a project that I think is going to do well or innovate some way in the space, I'll, you know, follow their Twitter, obviously turn on notifications, kind of pay attention there, but I'll go focus a majority of my attention on their Instagram 
Um, not all projects will give away whitelist spots and different stuff on their Instagram, but a good majority of the quality projects have been. Um, hype bears I got whitelisted for because of Instagram. Imaginary ones I got whitelisted for because of Instagram. Um, I got I was one of the first hundred people in the Mutant Shiba Club Discord server because Instagram. Um, a lot of these projects I've been getting whitelisted for. I think only one or two of them in the last month I've managed to get through Twitter. All the other ones are through Instagram. And I have tried sliding in a few of these DMs because, you know, got to like leverage the following and check mark and stuff like that. So I have gotten a few whitelist spots that way. But a majority of the quality projects I'm getting whitelisted for winning giveaways or just commenting on their Instagram stuff. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I completely missed that one. So I, I'm going to yeah. check it out because I'm, I'm on Instagram. I may as well. No, it works. It works, dude. Yeah. Like literally just with Hype Bears, um, they have like, it's the same thing. It's like they'll have 100,000 plus followers on Twitter, but you just go to their Instagram, there's five to 15 K max and you know, not even 10% of the comments that are entering the giveaways versus on Twitter. So it's a huge opportunity right now until people start catching on to it. Well, I mean, white list spots have become kind of insane, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, we've, we've I have got to the point of insanity, right? Like mm -hmm. as Giancarlo posted in his YouTube, I was just about to reference that. Are, are selling merch as, as a potential way to get on the whitelist, right? Like you're not even guaranteed yeah. on the whitelist anymore. You might get on. Um, but you know, look, it, 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 it's been a sure way for people to make money. Um, yeah. I've, I've been lucky to be part of a number of alpha groups where there's launch pads, uh, yeah. you know, Magic, Magic Mushroom Clubhouse, Squishy Squad, Journey Club. Uh, mm -hmm. But do you have any other tips for people to get onto whitelist or to find projects early? Um, more so the whitelist one, dude, I agree. It's just starting to get way out of hand. Like you gotta, you know, spend 12 hours a day in these discord servers and, you know, like sign your life away to try to win one of these whitelist spots. And then so they'll I'm, remove you. They'll remove and you. And then they'll active. remove you if you're not active that, yeah, two projects I'm in currently are doing that. So now I got to make sure I'm saying something every day in their discord. So I really hope that there's some, someone that kind of innovates the whole whitelist thing. I mean, we can't go back to, you know, doing stealth drops because that's not as trustworthy and legitimate as it was last year. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen with that, but in regards to uh, kind of some tips, um, can you reiterate your question? I had a thought. Yeah. I yeah. Sure. Choice. What, um, what, what are, what are you doing to find projects early, be it getting yep. a whitelist or just finding quality projects? Yeah, so the main thing I'm doing, honestly, is just spending time on Twitter and in discords and following a few uh, key YouTubers. Uh, the Twitter thing is like, I honestly, I just recommend making a new Twitter account. If you, if you care about your personal Twitter account, just make another one. If you don't care about it, just go follow like everybody I'm following or everybody you're following. Just find some sort of crypto person in the space that does a lot of NFT you know, stuff and just follow everybody they're following because it'll instantly turn your Twitter feed into like crypto Twitter. And it's going to be impossible not to come across projects on a daily basis because everybody's retweeting and tagging people to enter these giveaways. Um, people are launching their own project if they're, you know, some sort of influencer. Uh, and then apart from that, a lot of the alpha groups that you talked about in discords also talk about a lot of projects that are upcoming. A lot of them have launch pads where they're giving away spots uh, for those projects. And then the YouTubers, some of them I recommend, like we've been talking about, Brett Malinowski, um, Crypto Brando, Brandon, um, you know, yeah, Bento Ben's Boy. a couple of good ones as well, yeah. Bento yeah, Ben. Post a plug. Yep, exactly. Like all those types of people. One of my favorite guys recently, his name's, oh God, I don't know how to say it. Sahad, I think. S-A-J-A-D. Mm -hmm. um, he's at about 100,000 subscribers. And he does, pro he's probably my favorite person in the space just because he really breaks down um, his sort of trading. He's big on trading during uh, reveals. He makes, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on these big projects just trading the reveals. Um, so he's probably my favorite, but any of the guys we just mentioned, like just go start watching them on YouTube. A lot of them put out videos at least twice or three times a week where they're talking about upcoming projects. So Elab valuable. elaborate that. What, what's, what's his strategy at reveal time? Yeah. So pretty much what he does, um, I haven't attempted it yet. I kind of came up with my own strategy, which I'll make a YouTube video on, but I, I can touch on it a little bit here, give you some alpha. Um, but yeah, no, his strategy is pretty much, uh, he trades, you know, let's just use like hype for example, as a reveal. Um, you know, once the project starts revealing, it's already sold out and you know, you're on that date where you can finally start seeing what your NFTs look like. A lot of people immediately when they don't think they got a cool looking one will try selling on the secondary market immediately. Um, he uses some sort of tools he pays for, you know, Chrome extensions that allow him to see the rarity before the metadata, you know, updates on OpenSea. Um, and he utilizes that to purchase, you know, the ones that are getting list listed below the floor price and resell them for what the price of that rarity is, you know, going at. 
So sometimes, for example, say you have like, you know, maybe an NFT that's like a gold themed one and somebody sells it for like one Ethereum, but you can go check and the gold floor is like 1.5. So he'll immediately purchase that one, snipe it and then sell it for 1.5. And he's pretty much just, you know, uh, trade sniping using these tools and flipping immediately. Yeah, that's how actually I've made most of my money uh, in NFTs. See, I, I need you to give me, I haven't done that yet. I haven't bought any of those tools. Like the only tools I think I pay for is Nansen and IC tools right now, but to touch yeah. on that little alpha I was talking about, something I've actually gotten quite good at over the last two weeks, I kind of accidentally came across it is this is a free way that you can like trade during pre-sale without, you know, having a whitelist or without using any sort of tools. Um, what I like to do is I'll go on to the project's OpenSea page. I'll have three tabs open. I'll have the main, you know, floor price page. And then in the other two page, I'll filter, um, I'll go to the volume and filter by sales volume and listings volume. And if you're really paying attention to those two screens when the pre-sale begins and the project sells out, you can kind of judge and determine where like the little pumps are, you know, throughout the launch. So like, it's very easy to determine um, kind of like a ceiling almost, like say the project, you know, starts selling at two Ethereum and then people start signing off because they want to get rid of their NFT. You can really tell from the sales volume and the listings volume based off of how many sales are coming in versus how many are getting listed below the floor price where the bottom is going to be at. So you can buy in there and then kind of just flip that strategy to sell at the top. Um, and I've done it three times in the last two weeks just to verify that it works and that I can do it consistently. And I've called it literally every time. Ooh, and, so, and, and how do you identify the bottom? I'm, I'm good at identifying the top, but how do you identify the bottom? So, oh gosh, I, might, I, I made an email about this yesterday in my newsletter. It took me like three hours because it's like, I know how to do it in my head, but it's hard to kind of put into words. Right. Um, the best way I can describe it is when a project sells out and immediately starts selling, you know, on the secondary market, I like to analyze the sales volume. Mm -hmm. um, you know, normally people like listing to get rid of their thing. So a lot of people start undercutting each other. So right. in the sales volume tab, um, you want to just make sure there's like, let's just say there's five to 10 sales per minute coming in. And then on the listings tab, maybe there's over five to 10 per minute. So obviously there's more listings coming in that there are people buying. Um, and a majority of the listings are under the current floor price that's showing on that third tab I talked about. So let's just right. use like one Ethereum, for example, as the floor. When you're paying attention to this listings page, if you're seeing that over like 50, 60 percent of the listings coming in are either at the floor or below the floor, that means you're probably going to keep going down a little bit until you see that a majority of the listings coming in are starting to be above the floor price. Right. Um, and while you're kind of analyzing that, you want to, you know, keep an eye on that sales volume. Because if the sales volume is staying consistent while that's kind of shifting on the listings volume page, you can kind of determine based off that where the floor is going to be. And once, you know, it gets 50 to 60 percent more of, you know, being above the floor listings. Right. In other words, the high of, volume is still showing there's a lot of interest in the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which way the wave is, is, is turning. Exactly. You just the main thing is paying attention to that listings page and kind of just determining what point a majority of the listings start to be above the current floor price. Yeah, and, and I, I would also add to that that you know, unlike you know, maybe traditional technical analysis, one other thing yep. that's really important is sticking on the Twitter, you know, have a tab open with the Twitter with that, yep. you know, that that project's hashtag and, and be in their Discord and see mm -hmm. how much excitement or how much fat is over there, right? Because, yep. um, you know, I, I had Captain Bad from Fresh Drops on the other day and there have just been so many screwed up mints recently and revealed. Yeah. And um, it doesn't take much for no. the avalanche of fad to hit, um, you know. Literally Pixelmon yesterday, for example, absolute chaotic launch they had selling out their Dutch auction at three ETH or whatever. And then, you know, the floor dropping to under one Ethereum within like two or three hours. Um, yeah. That was another example where I just did my little thing. If you like did that strategy I just talked about on that, you could have made one to like 2.5 Ethereum trading the two or three big up and downs they had on the way down. Amazing. Amazing. Nuts. Um, I want to, I want to do one story with you before uh, we, we close this up. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a foodie. Um, okay. So when I saw that you had had a food story, uh, I just, I just, you know, it, it behooves me to embarrass you a little bit. So tell me what happened yeah. there exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, uh, what he's talking about is on my Instagram page, and I, I made a YouTube video about it, Will, but you can get the gist of it from the Instagram post. Um, one of the most recent times I was down in Miami, I think this was in November, I want to say. Um, I was down there and I hit up a buddy of mine. His name is Brian Breach, uh, literally the king of going viral and getting posted on international news publications and just news channels. This guy is a genius when it comes to just making good content. 
um, I hit him up and I was asking him like, yo, let's collab on something. Let's do something crazy out in public. And uh, he was going to brainstorm about it. But on the same call, he mentioned that he was on a TV show called Dining Divas TV, which runs in South Florida and, you know, a little bit, of, you know, all, all the state of Florida. If you're down there, you probably have heard of it if you watch, you know, some TV. But he yeah, was on that I've channel. That's yeah, exactly. So he uh, he mentioned that they were looking for a guest that week, that someone like backed out or something. They needed a new guest. So he plugged me up, got me featured on this TV show, you know, like I said, called Dining Divas TV, which is pretty much a group of Latinas that go around South Florida, go into just like the nicest restaurants. They try the entire menu. They taste test the whole menu, have all the wonderful drinks at all the restaurants. And then there's always a segment in the video where they bring on some sort of, you know, creator, influencer, celebrity, something along those lines. Uh, and they interview them while trying all the food. So that was pretty much the show. Um, I go in, we go to this nice restaurant a little bit north of Miami, and we try the entire menu. And normally when they bring on these guests, they like to, you know, end it with some sort of gag or joke or, you know, funny sort of entertaining moment. And since I do story times on TikTok, I, I haven't mentioned that this entire episode, but I became popular for doing comedic story time. So I wanted to come up with some funny idea um, that would fit into my demographic. I could post it on TikTok and it would do well. Um, and everybody that was watching the episode could go see on TikTok and, you know, it fits the mold. So what I came up with was like, okay, we're trying the whole menu at this nice restaurant. Like, obviously the tab is going to be, you know, upwards of a few thousand dollars, including drinks and all that stuff. Like it's easily up there and dessert. So I was like, okay, what if like towards the end of the episode or my little segment, you know, I am like, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to get the tab for you. I'll get the tab, even though it was, it was compensated. Nobody knew that if they were watching it. But um, I was like, I'll get the tab, ladies. I got it. And they're like, oh, my God, that was so nice. Thank you. And they're like hyping me up. And then uh, when the tab comes, I check out the tab. It's like $4,000 plus. Dollars. It's like it's a ton of money. I'm like, oh, I don't got that type of money. I can't afford that. Like, right? So I do this bit. This is my outro, and my exit to the, the segment. It's like, guys, I'm going to get up and run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back, and then we can, you know, head out, do whatever. Um, and I get up to go to the bathroom, and then they cut to a camera angle where I'm, like, starting to walk, and I kind of turn around and make sure they're not looking, and then I just beeline it towards the front door, and I leave. And that's kind of my thing. I just left them with the tab. There's a funny video. If you want to check it out, it's on my Instagram, which I'm assuming you'll share the link to it somewhere somewhere along this podcast uh but yeah that's the gist of it it was it was that's super great. funny though it did well in the the cut angles it, it looked really funny cool yeah no no i love i love food channels uh, i i love the competitions and all of that so yeah. i've actually heard of dining divas and so i'm like oh you know i'm just flipping through your instagram and stuff saying i better check out this one and i just i, I really so laughed out loud at that so well done that was a really good gag man thank you um, i appreciate it what are you most excited about uh in the nft and crypto space right now oh gosh um honestly just the entire thing i think uh crypto gaming like a lot of people have been preaching lately is going to be huge this year um neo tokyo i would say is the project that's kind of you know paving the way in regards to what the success can possibly look like early on for these projects but i just think it's about to completely transform the gaming industry is huge literally the twitch you know co-founder tweeted out i think it was today or yesterday that you know he's the founder of twitch and he thinks nft crypto gaming is going to be way bigger than twitch um especially like play to earn games i think that is like the whole thing that's going to take over this year whether that's nfts or you know um all coins different cryptocurrencies that just are successful so just being involved in this space and kind of just watching it develop and then furthering my education on you know trading and collecting uh, has me the most excited. And then obviously, like we talked about a little bit before this, I have a project that I'm working on that's coming uh, around summertime, hopefully before hey, summer, I'm going to launch it. Tell us, tell, us, tell us what you can. Yeah, so uh, it, long story short, it's going to be, um, I kind of wanted to touch on this earlier, so I'll touch on it now. Um, I think one of the main ways a lot of you know mass adoption is going to happen is with NFT projects that have a ton of real world utility. I think that's going to be able to make the most sense to people that don't know what NFTs are. Um, the way I always try to describe, you know, NFTs to my friends, is like picture like the American Express black card, the Centurion card. Um, obviously, it's just a piece of metal. It's a piece of plastic, but it has, you know, use cases in the sense where you have a certain, you know, fund you get to spend on it. Um, it gets you access to 24-7 concierge, all these private clubs, dinners. You can get reservations that are sold out that you couldn't get otherwise. Like there's a bunch of use cases for it. So um, my project specifically is going to be targeting the fitness and health space just because that's where a lot of my passion lies apart from crypto and NFTs is fitness. Um, so I just have a ton of real world utility 
that I plan on providing with this project. And just to give you guys a little, you know, um, hint as to what it's going to be. Uh, if you want to live like a healthy lifestyle right now, what do you got to do? You got to pay for a gym membership. You got to buy fitness clothing. You got to maybe pay a ter- personal trainer, buy fitness programs online. If you don't know how to, you know, work out and make your own workouts, you got to, you know, pay for food, go shopping. Maybe you got to do recovery, go to a med spa, a chiropractor, all this stuff. So what if there was a way where you could, instead of paying for seven or eight different things a month, paying different subscriptions, you could buy one thing that gives you access to all that um, every single month for free, as long as you hold that. So like a lifestyle credit card. Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. For the fitness and health space. So yeah, I I, I think, I think a credit card is actually probably the best analogy uh, as we start to go mainstream. I I really do Uh, because, you know, we keep dropping this term, you know, your NFT is an access token into a community and all of these use cases. But until we start to see more of these real life use cases, people just aren't kind of clicking what that means. And, um, you know, yeah, a black card used to be this mysterious thing, right? Um, You know, there's even a story where Bill Gates apparently went into a, a travel, uh, sorry, into a realty agency and, uh-huh. um, and, you know, said, I want to buy an island. And, you yeah. know, and, and they said, how are you going to pay? And he said, well, I'll, I'll pay with my black card. And she, she started laughing. And then she looked at the name and said, Bill Gates. And she called the police. <laughs> God, I so, haven't heard that story. That's funny. Yeah, but it makes so, sense, so though. cool. It's cool. I'm, I'm going to hit you up for some whitelist spots, of course, when you get oh, close 100%. to the time. I've got, I've got communities to feed, right? I've got, I've got friends and family who, who rely no, on me. No, I got you. And gotcha, uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, for anyone listening, if this kind of content interests you, uh, I'm going to throw some links in for Anthony down below. And please like and subscribe. I'll be doing these regularly. Thanks, man. No problem, man. I appreciate you having me on. Have a good day.